How many of these expressions are familiar to you? Do you know where they came from? The blind leading the blind. Our daily bread. For everything, a time and a season. The apple of my eye. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. God helps those who help themselves. Turn the other cheek. A good Samaritan. Am I my brother's keeper? Go the extra mile. Separate the sheep from the goats. Maybe you were aware of these sayings, perhaps all of them, but do you know from what faraway place long ago they all come? All of them have one source, the Bible. Well, all of them except one. God helps those who help themselves. That comes from Ben Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. These sayings could be multiplied many times over to show how deeply the Bible has influenced our language, our thinking, and our culture. No other book has had such a singular influence on the development of our civilization in the Western world. In the United States alone, there are over 17 Bethels, 18 Edens, and 30 Salems, all named after Bible locations. And there are a host of others such as these in eastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Nazareth, Ephrata, and Bethlehem. But what is this book that we call the Bible? This series of programs will introduce you to the most influential book ever written. Now, let me reassure you right at the very beginning, you don't need to know a lot about the Bible to enjoy these programs. In fact, you don't need to know anything at all about the Bible, because this series is intended to provide you with a simple and a basic introduction to this most fascinating book. And for those of you who are familiar with the Bible, there may be some surprises. In this program, we will give you a general overview. Next, how we got the Hebrew Scriptures and then a program on the Christian scriptures, and finally, how these writings have come down to us over many centuries and the influence that they've had throughout the world. The Bible is the most circulated and most translated book in the history of the world. It goes back as far as the innovation of the Gutenberg Press, when the Bible in Latin was the first large book to be printed by movable type in the 1450s. Ever since, year after year, more copies of the Bible are printed than any other book. For the most recent year, over 60 million complete Bibles, over 90 million New Testaments, and over one and one half billion scripture sections were published in over 2,000 languages, and the press run quantities keep growing every year. But even though the Bible may exceed all the rest in circulation, it also leads all the rest in the controversy it generates. In fact, the Bible has always provoked heated debate, drawing passionate reactions from some of the great thinkers and leaders across the ages. If we would destroy the Christian religion, we must first of all destroy man's belief in the Bible. A thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. The inspiration of the Bible depends upon the ignorance of the gentleman who reads it. It is impossible to mentally or socially enslave a Bible-reading people. One does well to put on gloves when reading the New Testament. The proximity of so much impurity almost compels to this. 
I have searched in it vainly for even a single congenial trait. Everything in it is cowardice and self-deception. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated through this book. All things desirable to men are contained within it. Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and tortuous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we call it the work of a demon than the work of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. Within that awful volume, the Bible, lies the mystery of mysteries. And better that they'd never been born, who read to doubt or read to scorn. The Bible is the greatest benefit which the human race has ever experienced. The Bible grows more beautiful as we grow in our understanding of it. Well, you can see that when it comes to the Bible, we're dealing with something very powerful and perplexing. Stop and consider how, going back to George Washington, this is the only book ever used to swear in presidents and governors, or the book that witnesses are asked to place their hands on before giving solemn testimony in a court of law. And what's so interesting about the Bible is that it is in some ways so simple a small child can grasp it, yet in other ways the most brilliant minds have never been able to master it. Uh, I heard one time the Bible compared to a pool of water, a pool that in parts is so shallow that a child can go wading in the water, but a pool also that is, as, is so deep at another place that an elephant can go swimming there. Well, the Bible is a wonderful book that involves passages which in some cases are very deep and profound. But in general, the Bible as a whole is simple enough for anyone who's untutored to read it and to understand what God's will and way would be for that person. Bibles come in every imaginable shape, size, and format. From this children's picture Bible, or if you prefer, comic book Bibles. This is what the first edition of the King James Bible looked like. At a much smaller level, here is the whole Bible the size of a thumb. This one was actually called the Thumb Bible. It was small and convenient for pioneers to take with them as they braved the wilderness. Then there was this Finger Bible. Here is the whole Bible on this small piece of microfilm. Here is a poster with a whole gospel. Or here, a poster with the whole New Testament, with the typeface spaced in such a way as to create the image. In Ethiopia, the Gies tribe uses only handwritten copies of the scriptures on animal skins. This is the book of Psalms and their conception of King David. Here is the Bible on audio cassette. Or you can have the Bible on your computer, in English, or if you prefer, in the original languages, Hebrew and Greek. The Bible has been animated on film in several versions for children, and whole books reproduced word for word on film. The one person whose life has been interpreted on film more than any other is Jesus, from the pages of the Bible. The versions of the Bible are in the thousands. There's probably not a single communications medium or art form into which the Bible has not been put. What does the word Bible mean? The word probably comes from here. This is the port of Byblos in Lebanon. Byblos was known to be an important place for the shipment of papyrus. Byblos in the old Greek language originally meant the inner bark of the papyrus plant. Papyrus was used for paper in the ancient world. You can see how we get the word paper from papyrus. 
Papyrus then was used to make books. So Byblos, from the papyrus plant, referred to books. It's as simple as that. Bible simply refers to book. And what we think of as the Bible wasn't even called the Bible until about the 4th century AD. The Bible is thought of as a holy book. In fact, publishers find that when they put the word holy on the cover so that it says holy Bible rather than just Bible, they sell more. But what does this mean? Many religions have books that they consider holy, and the origin of holy books is explained in very different ways. For example, followers of Islam believe that their holy book, known as the Quran, was revealed directly from God to the Prophet Muhammad over a period of about 20 years, beginning around the year 610. The revelations came through various means, including dreams, directly hearing from God, and through the angel Gabriel. Mormons claim that their holy book, called the Book of Mormon, came to their founder, Joseph Smith, when an angel named Moroni told Smith where some golden tablets were buried. Smith found them and translated them, and they formed the basis for the founding of the Mormon church. The origin of the Bible is accounted for in a quite different way. The Bible is rooted and grounded in history. It deals with what happened at places like here on the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus stepped into a boat to teach. This boat, dating back to the very time of Jesus, was discovered just a few years ago. The Bible came from the experience of specific people in specific places at specific times. The Bible deals with the meaning of human life on this planet from within the stories of people who lived on this planet. Now, we are not discussing the question of whether or not the Bible was inspired by God, as most Jews and Christians believe regarding the scriptures. We're simply observing that even if they are inspired, the inspiration was worked out through a process that involved human life, human history, the stuff of life that is common to us all. The Bible is about people and events that took place in our world. The Bible, for the most part, centers on a small part of the world, this region, the Middle East, with the primary events taking place in the small land of Israel. Israel is roughly the same in size as the state of New Jersey. You can readily see why this region has always been a kind of crossroads of the world. Here, Africa, Asia and Europe meet. This is where most of the Bible was created and where most of the biblical events happened. And we can go back today to those ancient worlds and visit many of the very places where the events recorded in the Bible actually took place. Egypt, where the Hebrews were enslaved under the Pharaohs. The Jordan River that the Israelites crossed to enter the Promised Land. That Promised Land that then, as today, is so inviting, yet in other ways so intimidating. Bethlehem where David tended his father's sheep and where Jesus was born. The site of the upper room on Mount Zion where the Last Supper was held. Caesarea on the Mediterranean Sea, a key early church location for the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. Corinth, a busy Greek seaport to which two New Testament letters were written and the focal point of the lands of the Bible, the city of Jerusalem, sacred today to Jews, Christians and Muslims. This city is mentioned 656 times in the Bible. Over the centuries, Jerusalem has been destroyed 17 times and 18 times rebuilt. And this world that the Bible deals with has been around for a long time. Bear in mind that this is a book whose writing was finished some 1,900 years ago. But how long do you think that it actually took to write this book? 
Well, how long does it usually take to write a book? Rabbi Jacob Neusner tells us in the introduction to his book, A Rabbi Talks with Jesus, that he wrote it in eight days. Three Blind Mice is Ken Auletta's account of how the American TV networks haltingly groped their way into the new communications environment it took him six years to find out and tell us. Diane Middlebrook claims that she worked for ten years on this one, her biography of poet Anne Sexton and her tumultuous life that ended in suicide. Saint Augustine lived in the time of the barbarian invasion of the mighty Roman Empire. He tried to make sense of what was happening to the world and worked for 12 years on his classic City of God, written in the early 5th century and still published today. So books can be written in a short time or take years. But when we come to the Bible, there's just nothing that compares with it. The Bible took well over 1,000 years to write by dozens of different authors. That's right, over 1,000 years. And that's the minimal amount of time beyond dispute. Indeed, it probably took much longer to write. You remember we showed how the word Bible really means just book. Well, that can be somewhat misleading because the Bible itself is more like a library of books. A library that was written and gathered together over a very long period of time. Let's look at this library. We traditionally divide the Bible into two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Testament refers to a will or covenant. So the Testaments refer to a kind of agreement between God and his people. First came the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures. Later, the New Testament or the Christian scriptures. For the Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament, Jews, Catholics and Protestants all agree on the exact same 39 books that make up this section of the Bible. Jewish scholars often counted these books as 24, but that's because some were combined and counted as one. For the New Testament, just about all Christian bodies agree to the exact same 27 books. There is an additional section in the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles called the Apocrypha, or Deuterocanonical books. Some Protestant Bibles also include them as valuable for edification, but not as authoritative scripture. For this series, however, we'll not deal with these additional books, but we'll confine ourselves to those books of the Old Testament, which Jews and Christians accept, and those of the New Testament, acknowledged by all Christian bodies. Thus, in our Bibles, we have the very same books that were recognized as Holy Scripture by the Jewish people when they finalized the Old Testament, and the very same books that were recognized by the Christians when they confirmed the New Testament. But there are also some obvious and inevitable differences between our Bibles and the original writings. First of all, the languages in which the scriptures were originally written are different. Today, we have translations. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew and some in Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. The original versions and the ancient copies of the originals didn't have chapter or verse divisions as we have in our Bibles today for easy identification of passages. These are relatively new innovations. Verse divisions for the Hebrew scriptures were probably introduced in the 10th century by Jewish scribes known as Masoretes. Bishop Stephen Langton who later became Archbishop of Canterbury, divided the Bible into chapters while at the University of Paris in the 13th century. Robert Estienne was a French printer who introduced verse divisions into the New Testament while a refugee in Geneva in 1551. The chapter and verse divisions enable you to find specific places in the Bible quickly. It's not like a typical book where someone can just give you a page number or chapter to find. Because the Bible is 66 different books, you need to have the book title to look something up. And while there's an organization to the groupings of the titles that you can soon come to recognize, the titles themselves don't always suggest a logical order. Some titles indicate the person the book is about. There are Ruth, Job, and Jonah. Other titles indicate the theme. There is Genesis or Beginnings 
and Exodus, about the Israelites leaving Egypt. Or the title can indicate the kind of literature. There are chronicles or history. There is the book of Psalms. They are songs. Proverbs is a collection of wise sayings about how to cope in life. Or the book can be named after the author or messenger. Here are the words of the prophet Isaiah, or Joel, or Amos, or the accounts of the life of Jesus by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then there are books named after their original destination, such as believers in a particular city, as is the case with Romans or Ephesians. Other books were given the name of individuals to whom the writings were addressed. Paul wrote two letters to his young follower named Timothy. Another was to Philemon, a disgruntled master of a runaway slave. Once you know the book title, you find on what page that book begins, and then go to the chapter and verse. For example, if you see a reference to "Our Father who is in heaven," as Matthew six nine, you simply have to find Matthew in the contents, go to that place. And then look for chapter six and the ninth verse. The writers of the Bible were incredibly diverse. There was Moses, a prince in ancient Egypt who became the great leader and lawgiver of Israel. Solomon, a wise and wealthy king. Ezekiel, a priest and prisoner of war. Amos, a shepherd in Israel. Matthew, a despised collector of taxes for the Roman government. Peter, a fisherman. Paul, an educated Jew who became the greatest Christian missionary ever. These and over two dozen more wrote, as we've noted, over a thousand-year period, but the earliest of the writings begins well over three thousand years ago. But their combined work. Still speaks to people everywhere in every age, yes, even our own. They wrote with ruthless and sometimes embarrassing honesty, and they push us to look at the basics: what we are to think of ourselves, how people are to treat each other, how to handle our guilt and fears. How God reaches down to people. How we can find God. How nations are to relate to each other. How humankind is to relate to nature. What is the meaning of life, and the reason for the universe? The Bible is the most amazing book. That the world has ever known, no other book has been as widely read, or translated, or touched as many lives. People over the centuries have looked to it for wisdom and for guidance. For just one example, countless people have found courage and strength in this simple meditation from the Book of Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Join us for the next programs as we see how we got the Bible.
They all had something in common that no one else will ever have in common with them. A political leader and great lawgiver. A shepherd who was the youngest of many brothers. A renowned king who had over a thousand wives. A political prisoner. A caretaker of trees. The husband of a prostitute. What did they all have in common? What Moses, David, Solomon, Jeremiah, Amos and Hosea had in common is that they all wrote parts of the Hebrew Scriptures, what is commonly called the Old Testament. It took many people. There were probably at least 30 primary authors. It took a long time, in fact, over a thousand years, from at least 1400 to 400 BC. This collection of writings is revered by Jews and Christians even to this day. A Jewish Simhat Torah festival. people in almost frenzied delight. They celebrate a book. They do this every year upon the completion of the annual cycle of Sabbath Torah readings in the synagogue. Today we introduce the Old Testament and frankly we can only scratch the surface. We can give you some basic facts related to this book but those to whom it was originally given would perhaps remind us that we're dealing with something that is for them far more than just a book. I read it as Jews have loved it. For example, did you know this? I could tell you what is the middle word in the Torah. I can tell you what's the middle letter in the Torah. Because over the generations, Jewish scholars have read the Torah not as a novel to see how it ends. They've read it as a love letter. Why did he use this word and not that word? Why is there a space here? Why a comma instead of a period? They, the way you read a love letter now, what did she mean by this word? Uh, we have seen it as not just a book, not just stories, not even a law code. We have seen it as a love letter from God. These Hebrew scriptures decisively shaped the living memory and identity of a unique people. They are revered as writings from antiquity yet at the same time treasured, even today, as an ever-living word. A very old Jewish tradition has it that the Torah, or first five books of the Bible, existed in heaven before God gave them to Moses, even before the world was created. The legendary Rabbi Akiba in the second century actually called the Torah the precious instrument by which the world was created. And Judah Halevi taught that God created the world for the purpose of revealing the Torah. The scrolls used in Jewish worship are a collection of writings gathered over many centuries by the Jewish people. These Hebrew scriptures are also commonly called the Old Testament. Testament here refers to a covenant or agreement or a series of agreements between God and the people of Israel.
The Jews divide their scriptures, consisting of 24 books, into three sections, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. The Law is also called the Torah, or the Five Books of Moses, or the Pentateuch, which means five rolls. The Law consists of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These five books are the most important ones to the Jews. The other books are revered and important too, but the Torah is central. These books cover the foundational events in both human and Jewish history. Genesis begins at the very beginning, the creation of the world, and the first 11 chapters are about God's dealing with humanity. Then in chapter 12, the focus shifts to an individual named Abraham and his family. He lived about 4,000 years ago and came from the city of Ur, located in what is today Iraq. Abraham, at God's command, left his home and went out in faith to a different land to which he was called as the father of a promised nation. We meet his son Isaac and grandson Jacob. Genesis ends with Joseph and the people of Israel sojourning in Egypt to escape famine. In Exodus we learn how the people were enslaved in Egypt and about the miraculous deliverance God provided. Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy give us details of the formation of the Jewish people after Egypt and the laws, worship and teachings around which the delivered people were organized under Moses. The next section of the Hebrew Scriptures is called the Prophets. The Prophets are in two sections. The former Prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, give us the history of the Jewish people from entry into the Promised Land, the time Israel was ruled by Judges, the era of their kings, Saul, David and Solomon, and then the eventual division into two kingdoms, north and south, and the eventual fall of both kingdoms to invading forces after the people had neglected the law of God. The latter prophets give us more history and teaching of how God is dealing with his people. These are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Book of the Twelve. The Twelve are also sometimes called the Minor Prophets, not because they're unimportant, but because they are shorter in length. The third part of the Hebrew Scriptures is known as the Writings, a varied section that includes the Psalms, the hymn book of Israel, and the wisdom literature of Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. The other books are the Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Now while this totals 24 books, these correspond exactly to the 39 Old Testament books as found in Christian Bibles. The difference is due to dividing Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, and Ezra, Nehemiah into two sections each, and counting each of the 12 or minor prophets as separate books. It will help us to grasp what the Hebrew Scriptures are all about if we think of them as revolving around some key concepts, which for simplicity we'll summarize with words beginning with the letter P. They have to do with providence. The Hebrew Scriptures manifest a constant awareness that the God who created all is involved with his creation and active in the history of humanity. And the Bible's view of what history is differs markedly from the typical views that prevailed. In Bible times, it was common to think of the world as an endless cycle tied to nature and the seasons, or a wheel of unending recurrences, as the Greeks put it. Whereas the Bible's view is progressive or linear, with history having a purpose and the world moving forward to a goal. A people. The people who descended from the great patriarchs Abraham, Isaac and Jacob 
a people specially chosen and set apart by God for unique service in, to and for the world. A place. The land of Israel promised to this people by God if they would faithfully follow him. A promise. This people and God were united by a covenant or agreement that God would be with them, guide them, bless them, if they would follow his ways. Prophecy in two senses of the word. First, prophecy as warnings against injustice, idolatry, and social evil. Second, prophecy as predictions about the future, including the assurance that a Messiah would come to save and deliver his people. The Hebrew scriptures then are about God relating to human beings, his people, our world, and history. It deals with places that even now, thousands of years later, you can still almost hear the echoes of the historical events. Places like the land which Abraham left to follow God, or the Negev where Abraham settled after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, or Egypt where Israel was held in captivity, or the Jordan River that they crossed to enter the Promised Land, or Jericho, the walled city conquered by the Israelites, or Absalom's pillar near Jerusalem, erected to perpetuate the memory of David's tragic son. Thus the Hebrew scriptures are replete with stories about specific people and places. Let's look at just one in a little more detail. In the latter part of Genesis, we meet Joseph. He was the youngest of eleven brothers and his father's favourite. He was given a special coat. Their father's partiality and Joseph's attitude made the other brothers angry and jealous. One day, Joseph was sent to check on his brothers who were away tending their father's flocks. The brothers saw their chance. They stripped off his coat and threw him into an empty well. Rather than leave him to die, they decided to sell him to travelling merchants on their way to Egypt. Then they dipped his hated coat in the blood of a goat so that they could tell their father that he must have been killed by a ferocious animal. When he received their false report, the father's heart was broken. Joseph was taken to Egypt and sold again, this time to Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials. Joseph quickly distinguished himself and was given a high position. But Potiphar's wife had lustful desires for the young man. When he refused her advances, she framed him and had him put in prison. But Joseph had an amazing gift for interpreting dreams, and that was reported to Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. Pharaoh was tormented by troubling dreams, so he sent for the young man. Joseph so impressed the ruler and interpreted his dreams in such detail and so convincingly that he was appointed second in command to Pharaoh, administrator over all of Egypt. 
The dreams predicted seven years of famine would follow seven years of abundant harvests. And so Joseph arranged for massive storage of grain. The prolonged famine came as foretold and affected Joseph's family as well as all Egypt. So Joseph's brothers came to Egypt seeking to buy food. There they came face to face with the long lost brother that they had sold years earlier. Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize him. So Joseph tested them, even had them imprisoned so that he could see if their hearts had changed. He later sent them back to fetch the rest of the family and bring them to Egypt where they could find food. So it came about that this broken, strife-torn family was beautifully reunited. Joseph forgave his brother's violence and gave another of his amazing interpretations, this time not from a dream, but from his life and recognition of God's working behind the scenes. As he explained to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. The story of Joseph and the many others of Abraham's descendants were told over and over, detail by detail, when the people gathered by their fires. And they were recorded on parchment, animal skins. So the account of God's dealing with his appointed people would be preserved and never forgotten. The parchment writings were rolled up into scrolls. Over time, more sections were added. Some were recognized as having special importance and came to be regarded as sacred text or holy scripture. Dr. Bruce Metzger, one of the leading Bible scholars of our century, explains. So the development of this Old Testament canon was slow, layer by layer, and it looks as though the final capstone of a pronouncement of authoritatively declaring that to be now the complete Old Testament was a pronouncement made at a Jewish council in the town of Jamnia about the year 90 of the Christian era. The scrolls would eventually wear out and were given an honored burial, but first copies were made. And this raises an important question. Are the versions we have today in any way close to what the Old Testament people themselves had? Quite amazingly, the answer is yes. For the most part, we can be confident that what we have today is nearly identical to the ancient copies. We back that up by drawing your attention to the scribes and the scrolls. The copies of the scrolls of Hebrew scripture were made by a special group known as scribes. Israelite scribes learned their craft as a kind of holy profession in family-like guilds, as is attested in the Bible that mentions clans of scribes who inhabit Jabez. The Hebrew word for scribe is sofer. Its root meaning is to count. And scribes indeed were careful counters making sure every word and letter were accounted for. They worked under very strict conditions and regulations. They went about their work with a seriousness that many would consider almost fanatical today. For example, the Jewish Masoretic scribes who made handwritten copies of the Bible worked under rules designed to ensure utmost accuracy. No word or letter could be written from memory. The scribe had to say the word aloud. Before writing the sacred name of God, the scribe had to wipe his pen. A scroll was discarded if spelling errors were found. And perhaps most important, 
After copying, every single word and every letter were counted to verify accuracy and to be sure that they match the original. Before beginning his work, a scribe would cleanse himself in a ritual bath, a vivid evidence of the seriousness and sacredness of the task of writing a scroll. He was going to write the names of God and must do so with proper devotion and ritual purity. Then there are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Maybe you've heard the fascinating story of how a Bedouin shepherd boy was out with his flock along the cliffs on the northwest side of the Dead Sea. He thoughtlessly threw a rock into one of the caves. He hears something break. He investigates and finds ancient scrolls stored in large pottery jars. He has accidentally stumbled across the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. Many of these scrolls date back to before the time of Jesus and they include copies of sections of every Old Testament book except Esther. There is an almost complete copy of the book of Isaiah. Up until the discovery of the scrolls, the oldest available copies of the Hebrew scriptures dated from around AD 900. The Dead Sea Scrolls provided Hebrew text that was 1,000 years earlier and would show how much the text had been corrupted and changed over 10 centuries. It was a priceless opportunity to see if copies done so much later matched earlier copies that were, of course, that much closer to the originals. So just how well had the scribes done their job over so many generations? Scholars analyzed and discovered that there were some differences that is not the surprising part. What is surprising is that there were so few differences and that they were primarily on small matters such as spelling variations. This is so amazing that it would almost seem impossible. The first ancient Qumran texts led to just 13 minor yet clarifying alterations in the modern revised standard version of the Bible. In our day, there's a danger of misunderstanding the meaning of Old Testament because we tend to think of something that's old as being obsolete, something to be discarded. It would have perhaps been clearer if the different parts of the Bible were called the First and Second Testaments or the earlier and later. For the Old Testament is not important just to Jews. Christians look to it as an indispensable part of their scriptures, indeed the larger part. The two testaments contain a little over 750,000 words. The Old Testament is a little over 593,000 words, or about 77% of the space of the Protestant Bible. There are over 220 quotes of the Old in the New, and if we count allusions or references, it comes to over 400. 22 of the 27 New Testament books quote or refer to the Old Testament. Thus, while the Hebrew scriptures relate uniquely to the Jewish people, they are, in a larger sense, a legacy for all people. So the basis and foundation of the New Testament is the Old Testament. And we need both of them in order to have, as it were, uh, both eyes open with respect to God's law. Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully 
all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. Jesus Christ, seen in one of the many film interpretations of his life, said historian Will Durant, the life, character and teaching of Christ constitute the most fascinating feature in the history of Western man. That story comes from what we know as the New Testament. The New Testament came some 400 years after the Old Testament, but the New is deeply rooted in the Old. The earliest Christian church didn't have a Bible of its own. Its Bible was the Old Testament. But even as the Christian scriptures were being composed, they referred repeatedly to the Hebrew scriptures. These references include 58 of the 66 Old Testament books. Jesus was a Jew. His first followers were mostly Jews. They were steeped in the Old Testament and believed Jesus was the fulfillment of God's promises to his people in the ancient scriptures. These included predictions given centuries earlier, now seen as fulfilled in Jesus. In fact, there were over 50 such predictions, including he would be born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, he would cure the deaf and the blind. He would be betrayed by a friend, sold for 30 pieces of silver. He would be killed amidst criminals. But while the two testaments are closely linked, there are also major differences between them. The Old Testament was written over at least a thousand year period. The New Testament was written in a period of 50 to 70 years. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language. The New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament is about three times as long as the New Testament. 
The Old Testament concentrates primarily on a people, Israel. The New Testament centers mainly on a person, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. There are four main sections in the New Testament. First, there are four Gospels, or narrations, about Jesus. There is a history of the early church called the Book of Acts. Then we get to read other people's mail in the form of 21 letters or epistles, most of which were written by leaders to address problems in the young churches. The last book, Revelation, or the Apocalypse, shows how God in Christ will consummate history, judge all peoples and nations, and bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. After Jesus left them, the earliest Christians often met and worshipped in synagogues, but after the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, when the Christians did not fight alongside fellow Jews against the Romans, Christians and the Jews went their separate ways. The Christians usually met in homes, and in addition to their Old Testament scriptures, they told the stories of Jesus from reports given by the apostles of Jesus. But the church was spreading like a wildfire in the Roman Empire, through Asia Minor, Eastern Europe, North Africa, even to the center of power in Rome. As the word spread, reliable first-hand witness reports about Jesus were needed that could be copied and shared from place to place. The need for the Gospels also became evident when the church realized that although the Lord might return in the clouds at any moment, that they really didn't know how long it would be before he returned. So they needed trustworthy accounts of Jesus' life and words. So among the various accounts circulating, Four were approved for use in the churches. But why four Gospels? And can they be the actual words of Jesus, since they were written years after he spoke them? There were four different Gospels because the four authors wrote with different purposes and recipients in mind. It seems that Matthew concentrated on addressing Jewish concerns. Mark is a briefer, fast-action Gospel. Luke, a Gentile doctor, wrote more for the Greek mind, and John, the last to write, goes into more personal and theological reflection than the others. So they offer views of Jesus from four different angles, rather like a televised game where different cameras cover the same game and plays, but offer a variety of different angles or perspectives. But do we really have Jesus' very own words? Jesus never left us a written account of his teachings. That came from his closest followers. Could they accurately remember so much that he said over the three-year period that they spent together? In an oral culture, why wouldn't the words of Jesus be remembered in detail? If there's one thing that we can say for sure about Jesus' words, it is that they were memorable. His words stopped people in their tracks. No one ever spoke the way that this man does, was the conclusion of the temple guards. His style of storytelling and his cryptic summary observations would indeed be hard to forget. Professor Rainer Reisner at the University of Tübingen in Germany notes the remarkable capacity for memorization among Jesus' people. Copies of Old Testament books were very expensive in New Testament times. Only very rich people could buy them. For the ordinary people, the books of the Old Testament were found only in the synagogues. So if someone liked to practice the Old Testament in daily life, he had to learn passages of the Old Testament by heart. The first followers of Jesus were pious Jews. They were used to memorize large portions of text. Jesus himself 
acted as a Jewish teacher. And this meant that he summarized important point of his teaching in short, very well formulated, memorizable sentences. Uh, these uh, sentences he uh, could also formulate with poetic devices, for example, in parallelisms. To give uh, one example, Jesus said, for whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This sentence can be memorized after one hearing. But most of his teaching summaries, Jesus repeated at different occasions and in front of different audiences. So those disciples accompanying him all the time uh, could uh, hear these uh, teaching summaries and memorize them very well. Even in our own day, some consider it not a great feat to commit a whole gospel to memory. And he began again to teach by the seaside. Actor Alec McCowan held audiences spellbound in his one-man stage play that consisted of nothing more than a recitation of the Gospel of Mark. He goes on for a couple of hours. Word for word, the entire Gospel is recalled and repeated. And said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth, but when the sun was up it was scorched, and because it had no root it withered away. And we might also consider that Matthew, one of Jesus' closest followers, probably would have known a form of shorthand. Matthew probably knew shorthand. Uh, there are several reasons for this statement, for this assessment of the situation. He was, as we know, uh, a, a civil servant, a tax-collecting official in, in Upper Galilee. And in this position, a certain degree of, 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 uh, of shorthand writing was absolutely uh, obligatory. Now, we also know from contemporary evidence, uh, parchments and other indications from historical writings, that shorthand writing was a known technique among Jews and Greek-speaking Jews and Romans of that period. The rest of the New Testament consists largely of letters, in some cases written or dictated while the writer was in prison for his faith, as often happened to the Apostle Paul. These letters typically grew out of crises or problems faced by the young churches. Let's take just one example. The ancient city of Corinth, Greece, is located between two seas. It drew many travelers and was notorious for its sensuality and commercialized sex. The Apostle Paul planted a church there with some Jews and mostly Gentiles. As they struggled to grow in the faith, they experienced all kinds of problems. They were acting selfishly and thoughtlessly toward one another. There was bitter internal strife. Some held on to old pagan practices. Others were full of religious pride. There was sexual immorality, including incest. It was a mess. But it prompted from Paul words regarded by many as maybe the most beautiful and magnificent ever written. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always perseveres. Love never fails. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now, we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. The New Testament books were all handwritten. There were no printing presses then, so all copies were made by hand, some on parchment or animal skins, but most on a material called papyrus. The rich waters of the Nile. Its annual flooding provides nourishment for the agriculture of Egypt. The Nile was also home to the remarkable papyrus plant. Papyrus is a reed plant that grows on the banks of the Nile, usually from 6 to 12 feet high, and it can be as thick as a man's wrist. Ancient Egyptians regarded it as a sacred plant that they worshipped. They used part of the plant for food. The stalk was also used to make cords, string, mattresses, even cloth for wrapping mummies or making sails. They were even bundled together to make small boats. To make papyrus, the pith of the plant was cut into sections and then overlapped into vertical and horizontal strips. It was moistened and pressed together and then smoothed off and made into sheets. This is a piece of papyrus. If you look closely, you can see the different strips crossed over each other. Now for us, paper is cheap. Just look how much you get in a Sunday newspaper. But in the ancient world, papyrus was precious. A single sheet could cost the equivalent of two days' wages for a typical labourer. Now, as the quantity of New Testament writings grew, many sheets would be gathered together. Then they would be folded in half and then stitched together. This was called a codex. It was an early stage of the modern book. The various documents of the New Testament were copied and circulated to churches near and far. Now the canon is a list of those books that the early church regarded as authoritative word of God. So there was a necessity to sift among the various other books which Luke says were already being written by Christians in order to determine which books are the authoritative works that belong to the New Testament. What were those criteria by which that sifting occurred? First, the early church chose those books that were written by apostles or by associates of apostles. Mark and Luke were not among the twelve, but were associated Mark with Peter, Luke with the apostle Paul. Secondly, another criterion was how far a given book was harmonizing and uh, uh, altogether uh, in agreement with the other books that had already been in wide use in the church. 
And the third had to do with the way in which that understanding of the work of Christ formed what was called in Latin the regula fidei, the rule of faith. Now, this took many generations because, first of all, the 27 books of the New Testament were written in quite different places in the ancient world by different people at different times. Probably the first part of the New Testament that we have was the first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. Well, someone had to find these books, collect them, bring them together, and be assured that they were authoritative books. So this, very briefly, in a nutshell, is what we think happened about the collecting of the books of the New Testament. Church synods, church councils took place. They ratified what already had been the judgment of Christian believers, high and low alike, as to what books were in the New Testament. So I've been accustomed in my teaching to say, the New Testament is a collection of authoritative books. It's not an authoritative collection of books. It did not become authoritative because a group in a church council decided these should be in the New Testament. The books were authoritative as soon as they were written. The churches have always disagreed on many things, but they just about unanimously agree on which books made up the New Testament. But how close are the copies we have today to the ancient scriptures as they were originally written now almost 2,000 years ago? For as you'd expect, we don't have any of the originals of any of the New Testament books. Scholars carefully analyze ancient manuscripts to evaluate the quality of textual transmission. For most classical literature, the evidence is not always abundant. Here are some of the most famous works, the approximate time they were written, the year of the earliest manuscript that is available, the length of time between the original writing and the first available copy, and the number of manuscripts that are available to compare. Now look at the unparalleled wealth of biblical texts, both in quantity and closeness to the original. There are fragments of New Testament books that scholars agree go back as early as the year 125 AD. And recently, there have been some startling claims by Dr. Carsten Tieder in Germany that are attracting wide attention that some papyrus fragments can be dated as early as the lifetime of the apostles of Jesus. We know that among the 100 known papyri of the New Testament, there are some that belong to the first or early second century. Two of them are particularly important. One is a scroll fragment found at Qumran, giving us two verses from chapter 6 of Mark's Gospel. The other one is a codex fragment belonging to chapter 26 of Matthew's Gospel, bought in Luxor in Upper Egypt, now at a place at a college in Oxford. Now these two, both datable to the 60s of the first century or thereabouts, are not only proof of first century sources of the written New Testament compared to an oral tradition. They also show us that there was a transition from the scroll, the classical ancient format used by Jews and the Romans and the Greeks and so forth, and the codex, the new practical book-like format almost invented by Christians, made popular by Christians. And we can now show that this happened uh, before and at the time when the, the first community lived and worked and preached in Jerusalem around the year 70 AD. And that is very important, uh, not least because it helps us to understand that written sources, written documents existed at a period 
when eyewitnesses, apostles, disciples were still alive. Dr. T. disposition is being fiercely debated and probably will be for some time. But what is beyond dispute is the cumulative evidence for the reliability of the New Testament text. As we saw with the Old Testament, the New Testament too is rooted in history. Real people experiencing real life at specific times and places. Places you can still visit today and find many of them remarkably unchanged from biblical times. The Mount of Temptation, where Jesus struggled against Satan for 40 days. The Sea of Galilee, where Jesus called fishermen to be his followers, and where fishermen today still cast their nets. Bethany near Jerusalem, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and stayed with friends before he was arrested. The Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus agonized in prayer to God. It is said that some of these trees date back 2,000 years to Jesus' time. Dominus Flavet, the Lord wept, a church in the shape of a teardrop, reminds how Jesus from this place wept over the city of Jerusalem. The New Testament, written in the relatively small Mediterranean world, soon crossed the waters to every continent. This same New Testament, used for centuries, is still recited and remembered every week in Christian churches throughout the world, now some 2,000 years later. No other book has been as widely read in all of history. Today, it's still the most read book in the most languages throughout the world. The accounts may be ancient, but their ability to grip the heart, stir the imagination and change lives still exerts a lasting power in the lives of believers. We come now to the last in our series of four programs. We've seen what the Bible is and how the Hebrew and Christian scriptures were written, then gathered together, and then preserved for future generations. And we've also seen the incredible evidence that the Bible that we have today is essentially the same as originally written. But remember, this is a book whose writing was finished before the year 100. That's a long time ago. The preservation and circulation of the scriptures over the centuries is an extraordinary saga.
The Bible has amazingly survived despite vicious attempts to destroy it. In 167 BC, a brutal and mad tyrant, Antiochus Epiphanes, ruled over Israel. He determined to destroy the identity and religion of the Jewish people in a merciless and ghastly persecution. He ordered all copies of the Jewish scriptures destroyed. The books of the law that they found, they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Anyone found possessing the Book of the Covenant, or anyone who adhered to the law, was condemned to death by decree of the king. The Roman Emperor Diocletian instituted the Great Persecution in the year 305 AD. He attempted to exterminate the church and decreed that every manuscript of the Bible was to be seized and destroyed. He had the words Extincto Nomine Christianorum, the name of the Christians having been destroyed, put over the ashes of a copy of the Bible. But the scriptures have long outlasted Diocletian and Antiochus and other rulers who've tried to do away with the Bible. Other obstacles also kept the Bible from the people, including illiteracy and language and cultural barriers. The church in the Middle Ages spread to diverse peoples who spoke many different languages, so the scriptures were taught in many different ways. The written word was still basic, and the monasteries carefully attended to the copying and preservation of the Bible. They made sometimes magnificent and beautiful copies, reflecting the reverence the monks accorded to the Bible. But these did little to feed the souls of the common people. This was before the advent of printing, so every copy was done by hand. A single copy of the Bible could take up to a whole year for a scribe to write. But even if the Bible was available, most of the population could not read it. For example, in 14th and 15th century Europe, only 10% of the population could read, and only 2% could read effectively. So the Bible was taught in an amazing variety of ways. Pilgrimages took on great importance in the Middle Ages. Then, as now, there was special interest in visiting Jerusalem and the land of Israel to recall biblical events in their original settings. Sculpture depicted biblical people and events. Church music incorporated content from the Bible. Church architecture featured carvings and depictions of biblical themes. Stained glass in churches surrounded parishioners with biblical stories. Great artists spent whole lifetimes painting only biblical themes. Drama in church services in medieval Europe told the stories of the Bible. Here, the angels meet the women at the tomb of Christ and the story of the resurrection is told. At times, many plays would be given on one day in the chancel of the church. The dramas grew in popularity and moved outside to the marketplace. You see the boat on the right for the story of Jonah. The plays could last up to three days. Then there were the mystery plays and the pageant wagons that would roll through town one after another. Here, Adam and Eve are driven from the Garden of Eden. Here, David faces Goliath. So even in periods and places of illiteracy, the Bible was imaginatively given to the people, utilizing multiple art forms. But over the course of time, the church, that was in so many ways a civilizing and a spiritual influence, itself fell prey to the lust for power and wealth. Corruption increased. Superstition infected and distorted the gospel. Accumulated tradition was mixed with scripture, which often conflicted with its teaching. But over and over again, reform efforts emerged from within the church.
The Protestant Reformation in particular centered on the recovery of the Bible for the daily lives of the people. One of the most significant early reformers was a 14th century Oxford philosopher and priest, John Wycliffe in England. My child, he was born. close to common people and consumed with a May burning passion to purify give the you church. Peace, my daughter. One third of the land of England is owned by the church, my Lord Bishop. Such ownership is not the business of the church. Christ and his apostles lived in poverty. Might we not do well to imitate their example? Your own mouth condemns you, Wycliffe. First, you seek to undermine the authority of the church, of the bishops, and even of the pope. And now you instruct us how best to bring about our own downfall. You leave little room for doubt what the verdict of this court must be. One last question, Dr. Wycliffe. What spiritual authority would replace the one that you have just so effectively demolished? Your own fevered brain. No, Bishop Gordon. The only true authority. The Word of God. The Holy Scriptures. For yes. Yes, Doctor. I don't think I shall be needing this any further. Wycliffe's demands for reform cost him his prestigious position at Oxford University. This exile propelled him into the most important task of his life. My task now, our task, if you will, Nicholas, John, if you will, is to use this exile to translate the Holy Scriptures, all of them, into English. Our native English tongue said they could be heard and understood by all our people. Wycliffe and his followers began the momentous task of translating the entire Bible into English for the first time. Then they trained humble preachers to bring the Bible to the common people. We really dare to give the word of God in the common tongue into the hands of the common people. Do we fully understand what we are doing? Will some not abuse, misuse and misinterpret the scriptures? My brethren, of course some. But has keeping the scriptures as the property of the hierarchy and the clergy prevented misuse? No, indeed. It has furthered its abuse. We will give God's word to God's children and his spirit will guide them. It will take time for growth and understanding. But I fear what judgment may befall us if we dare not give out this word. Church authorities moved against Wycliffe, but he died as they prepared to silence him. Wycliffe's followers were hunted down and imprisoned, but Wycliffe's influence was so widespread and despised by church authorities that they dug up and burned his bones 44 years after his death but he had started something that could not be stopped. He is commonly hailed as the morning star of the Reformation. Martin Luther, a German Augustinian monk in the early 1500s, played perhaps the most visible role in bringing the Bible back to the churches. For I have sinned. Luther's I burden of guilt continually tortured his soul. No matter how hard he tried, he found no comfort he in religious God. ceremonies. He is holy. But in his study of scripture, Luther discovered the inner peace he so desperately sought. 
he found that forgiveness was not to be earned, but was a gift of God received by faith. At that time, indulgences were being sold in Germany to help finance the rebuilding of St. Peter's in Rome. These indulgences promised forgiveness of sins for the payment of a price. Luther could not now stand by and see forgiveness offered in this way. On October the 31st, 1517, he posted his now famous 95 Theses challenging indulgences. It was a quiet act, but was to become, as they say, a hinge of history. It set off an immediate furor across Germany. Luther argued his case before church authorities. In matters of faith, I think that neither council nor pope nor any man has power over my conscience. And where they disagree with scripture, I deny pope and council and all. A simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without. The church tried to rein in Luther, but the more he prayed and studied, the more he disagreed with the Roman church. Luther was called before the emperor and given one more opportunity to recant. Martin Luther, you have not yet answered the question. Give us a simple answer. Will you recant or will you not? You ask for a simple answer. Here it is. Unless you can convince me by scripture and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. can do no other. God help me. Amen. While Luther's teaching spread to many parts of Europe, in England, William Tyndale, a brilliant young priest, took up where John Wycliffe left off to bring the Bible to the common people. At an eventful dinner meeting at the home of his employer, Sir John Walsh, the determined young Tyndale encountered the local clergy. But the church has so many persuasions. One man follows Don Scotius, another Thomas Aquinas, another Bonadventure. If all these learned men are in contradiction one with each other, how can we know right from wrong but by God's word? God's word says, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Give the scriptures to ignorant men and they'll soon be tearing out their own eyes. Hither and yon will be a nation of blind men. Without God's word, we are a nation of blind men. But without the help of doctors, God's word is too hard to understand. And that is to measure the yardstick by the cloth. There are as many doctors as there are pieces of cloth, but only one yardstick of scripture. By what should we measure that? By the Pope. And what if the Pope is at variance with God's laws? Then it were better to do without God's laws than the Pope's. Well, young sir, what do you say to that? If God spares my life, I will see to it that a ploughboy shall know more of the scriptures than you do. Nothing could dissuade Tyndale from his pledge to provide scriptures for the common people. Church authorities in England prohibited him from translating, so he fled to Germany to work. His translations were smuggled back to England. When he was only about 40 years old, he was betrayed, captured and put on trial for heresy. His only defense was scripture, the book that he had devoted his life to. Take him away. And fifth, you assert that neither the Virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. 
How do you answer? I answer thus, with a clear conscience before God and man, that I have never maintained, affirmed, averred or asserted anything contrary to the plain meaning of God's holy scriptures. On these alone, and these alone I stand. Tyndale was condemned and sentenced to death. Before he died, he uttered a simple prayer. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Tyndale was executed in 1536. The following year, King Henry VIII authorized the use of the Bible in England among the common people. That English Bible was mostly Tyndale's work. It provided the basis for the Reformation in England, and it was a remarkable fulfillment of Tyndale's dying prayer. The advent of the printing press made possible the spreading of the Bible as never before. But it didn't happen all at once. This Welsh Bible belonged to a young Welsh girl, Mary Jones. In the summer of the year 1800, Mary Jones set out from her home in this Welsh village of Clanfernel to walk 25 miles to Barla in North Wales. She went alone, most of the way barefoot to save her shoes. Through the beautiful countryside she trudged on. Nothing could stop her. Not even the approaching thunderstorm. For six years, since she was ten, Mary had wanted her own Bible more than anything else in the world. She raised chickens and sold the eggs to earn money to buy the Bible. When she saved up enough, she set off for the only place in Wales where she could buy a Bible. That place was in Bala. Twenty-five miles later, she arrived and found Reverend Thomas Charles, who had the Bibles, but he had only one left, and that was promised to someone else. When he heard Mary's story, Reverend Charles decided that the other person could wait. Mary at last would have her own Bible to read to her heart's content. Mary's youthful dedication touched the hearts of Christian leaders in Britain and sparked the formation of the British and Foreign Bible Society in 1804. From that beginning, Bible societies sprung up all over the world. They now distribute millions of copies of scripture every year in hundreds of languages. From the earliest days, believers have hungered for the scriptures in their mother tongues. For centuries, Bible translation proceeded slowly. Here, you see the number of translations made century by century. But now, look at what has happened in the last 200 years. There are at least portions of the Bible now in over 2,000 languages. Today, it is envisioned that within a generation or two, the Bible may be translated into every known language on earth. Thousands of gifted linguists work in remote areas of the world right now to achieve that goal. The Bible has dramatically changed countless people's lives. This can be seen right across history in people from widely diverse cultures and social backgrounds. Augustine, born in North Africa in the year 354, was a brilliant young student. He chased after the popular philosophies of his age, lived with a woman not his wife and fathered a child out of wedlock. One day he read the scriptures and his life was turned inside out. 
he devoted himself entirely to God. As the old Roman Empire crumbled before barbarian advances, the writings of Augustine examining the ways of God with the world became foundational for the Middle Ages, and his writings are still widely read even today. Francis of Assisi in Italy was the son of a wealthy merchant. The words of Christ in the Bible prompted him to forsake his fortune and to take up a life of service. His love of God, humanity and nature influences multitudes to our own day. John Wesley said how his heart was strangely warmed in 1738 by Luther's preface to the New Testament book of Romans. Wesley went on to lead a movement that raised the whole moral climate of England. Some historians said his movement may have saved England from bloody revolution. Billy Graham, a farm boy from North Carolina, was never head of any church or religion. Yet he brought the message of God to more people than any other who ever lived. Why have so many millions from every continent wanted to hear him? Mr. Graham's message has always been based on the Bible. The word of God has not changed. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever, says the Bible in Isaiah 40. This book, I believe, was revealed by God to man. It is our guide. It's our compass through life. And God says, the word of our God shall stand forever. And who has not heard of the work of Mother Teresa, caring for the most wretched and poor? She said her work is based on the words of Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, where Christ said that we minister to him when we care for the hungry, the poor, the naked, and the sick. These are some of the most gifted and influential people who have ever lived. They made rare contributions to our world. What they have in common is that they all submitted to a call that they heard from the pages of the Bible. The Bible's influence in our civilization is simply unparalleled. It's inspired some of our greatest art, influenced the formation of our major institutions, and it's lifted our Western societies from barbarism to civilization. It's an old book, but somehow what it says about the meaning of life about what it means to be human, about what's important, about how we should live, about how to find peace with our souls, still speaks to people today, even as it has in every generation since it was given. I'm Russell Bolter. Thank you for joining us.